If you do not have a copy of today's outline, if you would raise your hand, some of our men will bring those to you, and I want to encourage you to keep your hands raised up tall until you get them. They'll bring it to your seat, and you can follow along with us in our study this morning. Last Sunday morning, we talked about the book of Joshua. And one of the things that we concluded in the book of Joshua is that the book of Joshua is a very positive book that talks about what can be accomplished when we follow God's will. The people obeyed God and they were able to come into the promised land and they were able to conquer the land of Canaan and make it their own home. This week we transition to another book and we bring to conclusion this week's study of the book of Judges. And the book of Judges is a very different book. It is a book of war. It is a book of bloodshed. It is a book of heartache and disappointment because of how quickly God's people forget him. I want you to take a look, if you will, from Judges chapter 3 and verse 7, the following statement. The sons of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Ashtoreth. I want you to notice that. I want you to notice that they forgot the Lord their God. And also in chapter 8 and verse 34, Thus the sons of Israel did not remember the Lord their God, who had delivered them from the hands of all their enemies on every side. You can imagine that the book of Judges is not going to be quite as positive. The book of Judges is not going to be talking as much about the rewards of God's people for being obedient as much as it's going to talk about the consequences to God's people for disobedience. So this morning we're going to take a look at the book of Judges and we're going to do so under the theme, Forget Me Not. I want you, if you will, to consider the following. In the book of Judges, very quickly, a pattern is established. And what I mean by that is uh, a pattern for the entire history of the Israelites during this time. There will be some 15 judges who will be called to lead God's people, who will be called to deliver them from uh, various oppressions. And it's during this time that we will see very early on a pattern that is established and a pattern that will continue throughout this period. I want us to take a look this morning at a template that is given for us very early on in chapter 2. So if you'll turn in your Bibles to Judges chapter 2, I want you to be able to read along with me as we see this pattern established. The first thing that I want us to look at is Judges chapter 2 verses 7 through 9. Judges chapter 2 verses 7 through 9. I want us to recognize that a leader at this moment in time has died and that is the great leader Joshua. We read that the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who survived Joshua, who had seen all the great work of the Lord which he had done for Israel. Then Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. And they buried him in the territory of his inheritance, in timnath Harris, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gosh. Now I want you to consider Joshua. We've talked a lot about Joshua. Joshua was that uh, second-hand man to Moses. Uh, Joshua was one of the 12 spies who went into the land of Canaan early on, but one of only two spies who came back and said, we can conquer it, we can take the land, God's on our side, who can be against us? Joshua is the one who leads the people through a parted Jordan River, across on dry land, into the promised land. And it's Joshua who helps them to take the land of Canaan. First the middle section, then the southern section, and then north to the northern section. It is under his leadership 
that the Israelites prosper in this new land. And his leadership was so great that the Bible records for us that when he died, those leaders who continued on in his stead were also faithful to God and led the people in the ways that are right. But now I want you to look at something else. In the very next few verses, verses 10 through 13, we read about an apostasy occurring. And if you're not familiar with the word apostasy, that is something that means to go against or to, to leave or to stray away from. So, for instance, if a person is faithful to God, they listen to Him, they, they follow His will, they obey His word, that, that's righteousness. But if a person apostatizes, if they are found to be in a, a condition of apostasy, they have fallen away from that truth. They have left the Lord. They have started once again to go back into the world. And so we see that after Joshua, very soon after Joshua dies, an apostasy occurs. Starting in verse 10. All that generation also were gathered to their fathers, and there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord, nor yet the work which he had done for Israel. Then the sons of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. And they forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods from among the gods of the peoples who were around them and bowed themselves down to them. Thus they provoked the Lord to anger. So they forsook the Lord and served Baal and the Ashtoreth. We read very early on that this new generation did not know the Lord, did not know God. And that does not mean that they had no understanding of who He is. What it means is that they had no relationship with Him. They had no interest in Him. They were perhaps concerned, as we sometimes are today, with our own lives. And so they in turn, they turned their backs on God. They forsook Him. Uh, they had heard of God... They knew the stories, it's just that they chose not to remember them. Now, I want you to please make sure you catch one very important point out of this passage. How long did it take God's people to abandon Him? One generation. In just one generation, they went from one of the greatest leaders and one of the most prosperous times of the children of Israel to a nation who followed evil and pursued sin in their lives. One generation was all it took. Take a look, if you will, chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, where we see that God turns around and punishes His own people. I want you to consider for just a minute how Israel was brought into the land of Canaan and, and God used His people to punish the Canaanites. He is now going to turn right around and use those very foreign, godless, idolatrous people to punish His own. Read, if you will, verses 14 and 15. The anger of the Lord burned against Israel, and He gave them into the hands of plunderers who plundered them. And he sold them into the hands of their enemies around them so that they could no longer stand before their enemies. Wherever they went, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil, as the Lord had spoken and as the Lord had sworn to them, so that they were severely distressed. Now do not misunderstand that reading. That does not suggest that God is evil, that he condones evil, that he wants evil to befall his people or any people. God is not a fan of evil. Quite the contrary. He is goodness in its most perfect form. But when God protects his people because they live for him, can you imagine what happens when they turn their backs on him? All it takes is for God to withdraw from the situation. All it takes is for God to allow the evil that is present in this world, the evil that is manifested by the servants of Satan, all it takes is for God to step back and allow things to take 
their worldly courses. And that's exactly what happens here. He no longer protects his people, but he allows them to be oppressed and distressed because of the people of the land. Consider verse 16, how God saves his people. We read that the Lord raised up judges who delivered them from the hands of those who plundered them. God raised up new people, new leaders for his people. And these men listened to God. They listened to his commands. They obeyed his will. And as a result, led the people into a good position once again. I was describing to a little boy this last week, we were talking about the judges, and I said, do you know what a judge is? And I think he thought that was kind of something like Olin was, you know, sits behind a big desk with a gavel, wears a robe over his Hawaiian shorts and uniform. I don't want to picture that. But I said, no, a judge here was, was kind of like our president or maybe like a king uh, or something like that, except a lot of these men and, and the one woman that's mentioned in the book of Judges, Deborah, a lot of these people were fighters. They were soldiers. They were generals. They were, they were the kind of people who could go and get the job done. They weren't going to, a lot of times, just use words, but they were going to put God's will into action. They were fighters, and they were defenders of the faith. And so God raises up judges. 15 times in this book to save his people. But I want you to consider something. The pattern is not only established for us in chapter 2, but the pattern continues throughout this book. I want you to read with me verses 17 through 19. Right after we read in verse 16 that God raised up judges to save his people, here's what we see continuing. Yet they did not listen to their judges... For they played the harlot after their gods and bowed themselves down to them. They turned aside quickly from the way in which their fathers had walked in obeying the commandments of the Lord. They did not do as their fathers. When the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge and delivered them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who oppressed and afflicted them. But it came about that when the judge died, that they would turn back again and act more corruptly than their fathers. In following other gods to serve them and bow down to them, they did not abandon their practices or their stubborn ways. You see, this is the book of Judges, a book that I often describe as a roller coaster of history in the life of Israel. Why? Because God wanted His people to succeed. But as soon as they were filled with success, as soon as they were the victors, as soon as they were on top, they forgot about God. And as a result, God withdrew and allowed them to be beaten by another people. And it would be then, in the valley of their despair, that they would lift up their eyes to God and, and they would cry out in repentance to save. And God, who loved His children, would save them. And so, once again, with the bringing in of a judge, they would be made victorious. But they would once again forget. And the cycle would start all over again. Time after time after time after time. After time in the book of Judges, this is the pattern that continues. Consider for just a moment how this pattern is repeated. I want you to look, if you will, to Joshua chapter 3, verses 7 through 11. I want to just simply mention something about this very first judge. We see, of course, that Joshua had died in Judges chapter 3, verses 7 through 11. And we see that the king of Aram enters the picture and he invades from the northeast and he oppresses Israel for eight years. The question is, why? I want you to look at with me at Judges chapter 3 and verse 7. The sons of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Asherah. 
They serve false gods. They quickly abandon the Lord. Why? Because they forgot about Him. They turned their minds away from Him. And as a result, Othniel is brought in to bring in victory. Consider for just a moment Ehud in Judges chapter 3, verses 12 through 30. In this particular case, this second of the judges, Othniel has now died. And Eglon, the king of Moab, enters into the picture. He invades from the southeast. Eglon oppresses Israel for 18 years. And God raises up Ehud. But question, why was this foreign king allowed such success over God's people? Judges chapter 3 and verse 12. Now the sons of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. Why did he allow his own people to be defeated? Because they forgot him. Consider also Deborah in Judges chapter 4 and also Judges chapter 5. Uh, Ehud has died. And Jabin, the king of Canaan, comes in in an invasion from the north and he oppresses Israel for two decades. Why? Take a look, if you will, at Judges 4 and verse 1. Then the sons of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud. Why? Because they forgot the Lord their God. Why? Because they turned their backs on Him. Why? Because they did not want to pursue the interests of God. They wanted to pursue their own selfish desires. What about the great fighter, great general, Gideon, in Judges chapter 6, 7, and 8? Deborah at this point has passed from the scene. The Midianites to the south rise up and oppress Israel for seven years. And so God raises up Gideon so that he can bring about 40 years of peace. But why did he have to? Why did he have to raise up another judge? Well, consider for just a moment Judges chapter 8, verses 33 and 34. Then it came about as soon as Gideon was dead that the sons of Israel again played the harlot with the Baals and made Baal Bareth their God. Thus the sons of Israel did not remember the Lord their God who had delivered them from the hands of their enemies on every side. Chapter 6 and verse 1 and also chapter 8 verses 33 and 34 describe for us the short-lived memory of God's people. Consider also Jephthah in Judges chapter 10 verse, and chapters 11 and 12. Jephthah. Once again, the Israelites do what we see is their pattern. They forget God. In chapter 10 and verse 6, The sons of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord, served the Baals and the Ashtoreth, the gods of Aram, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the son of Ammon, and the gods of the Philistines. Thus they forsook the Lord and did not serve Him. What happens? The Philistines and the Ammonites rise up. They oppress Israel for 18 years so that God will raise up another judge. What about in Judges chapter 13 through 16? We read the story of that strong man, Samson. A lot of people are kind of surprised to think that Samson was a judge. But Samson was indeed a judge. He was not all about strength. He was about ruling God's people. Although, in many respects, Samson was a, an immoral man. Samson made a lot of mistakes as we do. But the Israelites in chapter 13 and verse 1 once again did evil in the sight of the Lord so that the Lord God gave them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. But when the people cry out to God once again, God raises up Samson so that he can be victorious. And we know the great stories of Samson. How many of the Philistines he defeated on one occasion using the jawbone of a donkey single-handedly defeated a thousand of God's enemies. What do we see in all of this? We see the pattern repeating over and over again. We see people who don't seem to learn their lesson. And we as New Testament Christians sometimes look at these Old Testament representatives 
And we look at them with a critical eye. We might even look down at them a little bit. We might even do kind of like parents do to children. We look at our children and we wonder why they continue to make mistakes over and over and over again. And we fail to remember that we too were children once. We too had parents who looked at us and wondered when will we ever learn. And God looks at us in very much the same way as He looked at the children of Israel during the book of Judges. He looks at us sometimes and wonders when will we learn our lessons. So let's take a look at some lessons for God's people. Lessons back then and, and also lessons now. And let's see if we can learn something this morning. Number one, I want you to consider this statement. It's on your handout and it's something I want you to ponder for just a moment because it might be a little bit disturbing to you. The statement is apostasy is the rule, not the exception. Apostasy is the norm, in other words. And we look at that and we think, well, wait, is that true? Will God's people fall away? And the interesting question, or the interesting truth is yes. Many times they will. There are times in our lives when maybe some of us have turned away from the Lord and we have pursued our own selfish desires away from His care and His protection. But apostasy in the Bible and apostasy in our lives sometimes is indeed the rule, not the exception. Consider the Israelites of old. They continued to keep forgetting God. You would think that they would finally learn their lesson. But the point of this book is it seems that they did more forgetting than they did learning. Sometimes it only took them five to six years to forget God. Sometimes it took them 40 years to forget God. But it seems that as time moved on, at some point, they would choose to turn away from God and follow their own desires. Is the new Israel, are we today any different from the old? We're just as liable to forget as they were. Uh, we have heard the stories of the Old Testament. We've heard the stories of the New Testament. And yet still, we seem to get distracted on occasion. We seem to forget what all God has gone through and has done for us so that we might have the hope of eternal life. How many restoration movements have there been in the church? How many efforts have there been collectively and individually in our own lives where we have tried to restore ourselves to a pattern that would be pleasing to God only to find ourselves soon forgetting what it was that we were up to. Apostasy is the rule, not the exception for God's people. And apostasy should not surprise the church today. It's only a matter of time until we let down our guard if we're not careful. And I want to remind you of what we said before. It is we are only ever one generation away from complete and total apostasy to God. Don't take my word for it. Take God's word for it. Turn, if you will, in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. I want you to consider, in the very first century, only a few short years after the church is established, the Apostle Paul is telling the young Timothy preacher, get ready for apostasy. Get ready uh, for those who are saved to once again fall into the category of being lost. Those who have embraced God and His grace and mercy will be the same ones who will release God for selfish interests. 1 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, Paul says, But the Spirit explicitly says that in later times some will fall away from the faith. Now recognize, folks, we're not talking about the world who are already in sin. We're talking about those who are believers, those who are in the body of Christ, the faithful few. He says some will fall away from the faith. 
paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. By means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own consciences with a branding iron, men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. What's Paul saying to Timothy? Be careful. Be on the lookout because God's own people will very soon forget him. They'll start listening to other people rather than God. They'll start obeying other commands rather than His. And as a result, they'll buy into false doctrine and they will fall away from the faith and they'll pay the consequence of it. We shouldn't be surprised that apostasy will take place. Consider also Hebrews chapter 3 verses 12 through 14. Hebrews chapter 3 verses 12 through 14. The Hebrews writer says in verse 12 to an audience of Christians, he says, Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. Now there are some people who have bought into a false doctrine that is described as once saved, always saved. That is so foreign from the Bible. That's foreign from the Old Testament. That's foreign from the New Testament. And here is a New Testament writer writing in the age of the church to a group of Christians and he's saying to those Christians, be careful that none of you embrace evil. Why would a Christian who's saved embrace evil? If they're saved, then they're going to do good things, not bad things. But he is saying that any one of you can become evil in your heart. Any one of you can fall away from the living God. Now the great thing about the Hebrews writer is, he says, but here's the solution. If indeed apostasy is the rule, not the exception, here's how you can make stronger your spiritual fortress. Here's how you can strengthen your spiritual lives to withstand the onset of apostasy in your life individually or in the life of the church collectively. He says in verse 13, But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. Yeah. Apostasy may be right around the corner in our lives individually and in our lives collectively, but it doesn't have to be that way. What he is saying to us here is we are Christians. We are partakers of Christ. We have been blessed to be made a part of the family of God. And as such, we need to hold fast. That means be diligent. Be on the alert. Be vigilant about our Christianity. Let's make sure that we stand firm. And this is not only something that we do individually by relying on God and by, by, by leaning on Him for strength and support, but it's something that we do by relying on each other and leaning on each other for strength and support. Encourage one another day after day as long as it is called today. Just like God had a family in the Old Testament, He's got a family today. And if they didn't look after themselves in the Old Testament to be true to their God, they got in trouble. And if we don't look after each other today and be true to God and be true to His Word, what will befall us? The Bible's clear. We'll fall away. Let's take a look at lesson number two. God disciplines those He loves. God disciplines those He loves. You know, I don't know about you, but I absolutely marvel at the patience of God. I marvel at the patience of God because I know that no matter how patient I try to be with myself or anybody else, I wouldn't be as patient as God was with Israel. You know, sometimes after the first time they make a mistake, you, you, you seem to want to be pretty hard with them, but you'd think after the third or the fourth time that they turn away from God, that they fall away from His protection, and they're reminded again of how important it is, you would have thought that they would have learned it. Othniel, Ehud, Shamgar, Deborah, 
Gideon, Abimelech, Tola, Jer, Jephthah, Ibsen, Elon, Abdon, Samson, Eli, Samuel. Fifteen judges. He brings out of love to remind his people that he wants them to be safe. He wants them to be saved. But if they're going to do wrong, he's going to discipline them. Not because he hates them, not because he wants to hurt them. Discipline, true discipline, comes out of love because of a desire for the other person's well-being and the natural desire for that person to be made well. Let's take a look in our New Testament at Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 3 through 11. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 3 through 11. Once again, the Hebrews writer says something to us that's very, very important. He describes for us what God's discipline really is all about. And he uses it in terms that we might understand, the way we are disciplined as human beings by human parents. In Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in verse 3, we read, For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by Him. For those whom the Lord loves, He disciplines, and He scourges every son whom He receives. It is for discipline that you endure, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they, and he's talking about parents, they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good so that we may share in his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it afterward, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness." I had growing up, and I still have, I'm blessed to say, two very good parents. And they did the best they could to raise me. And let me be real clear, I got in trouble a lot. I've been grounded many times. I have been spanked probably even more. And not one time that my parents ever disciplined me did they do so out of some sick, morbid, selfish interest to hurt their child. My parents did it because I did something wrong and they wanted to help me to understand that that wrong would be equated with pain with the hopeful idea that in the end I would be made better as a result, that I would learn a lesson and be true. Uh, even with those good intentions, our parents make mistakes. There was one time I got in trouble for something I didn't do. My mom misunderstood something and she went straight for the, the, the board and I got a spanking and I, I remember telling her years later I was absolutely innocent and you spanked me. Mom did not flinch. She said, well that just took the place of all the times you should have gotten a spanking that you didn't. <laughs> they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to him. But notice what verse 10 reads. He disciplines us for our good. God doesn't make mistakes. God doesn't get the details wrong. When He punishes us, it's because we deserve it. But realize that the discipline we receive in this life is discipline that we can overcome. When God chastises us, when God disciplines us, He does so because He loves us and He wants us to be made whole while there's still opportunity. Because brethren, none of us want to face the discipline of a devil's hell where there will be no turning around, where there will be no turning back, where there will be no second chance. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 19 reads, Those whom I love, 
I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. If there's something that's wrong in our lives and God's disciplining us, helping us to understand why we're wrong, that may be from the standpoint of doing something publicly and getting in trouble for it. Now, it may be something like doing something privately and being pricked in our hearts, cut in our hearts, because we realize with a guilty conscience that we have disobeyed and disappointed our Lord. When God disciplines us, realize that's a good thing because He does so out of love. And our final lesson, lesson number three, God uses leaders to restore His people. God uses leaders to restore His people. You know, it is always when God raises up a leader, a good leader, a faithful leader that change takes place among his people. The entire book that we are reading about and that we did read this last week, the book of Judges, is about men and women that God chose to lead his people back to himself. And I want you to consider for a moment some of the people that he chose, some of the most unlikely candidates for leading his people. One was the son of a prostitute. Another was a doubting Thomas who asked for three signs from God before he would accept God's call. Another was a woman in a male-dominated society. One of the things that Judges shows us is that God doesn't play favorites as to who he's going to pick to be his leader. He simply chooses the best. And let's consider that in the church today. You know, we've got some people who will make great elders one day that may seem unlikely candidates right now. We have some people who maybe don't take seriously God's word and don't take seriously God's will who will someday be faithful and sound gospel preachers. How many of our young people today will be those Bible class teachers of tomorrow? We've got two of our young people this week, this Saturday, who will leave to go do mission work in a foreign country? Who will be our missionaries of tomorrow? God often chooses very unlikely candidates, but He chooses people who will get the job done because He wants faithful, strong leaders to constantly be present in the lives of the church so that those people can be restored to a better faith. I want you to consider, if you will, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. A passage of Scripture that means a lot to me because it's very personal in more than one way at this point. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13, the Apostle Paul says to the church at Ephesus, in the first century, he gave some as apostles and some as prophets. Now, in both these instances, we were talking about people who were chosen and who had the ability to do things of a miraculous nature because they were still alive during the first century. We do not have apostles today. We do not have prophets who are miraculously able to convey God's will to the people today. But notice who he says next. He gave some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers. Some as evangelists, those who would do their work evangelizing or spreading the message of, of Jesus Christ from place to place. Some as pastors, these are elders in the church, those who would shepherd the flock of God. He also talks about uh, those who would be teachers. Uh, this could be anything from Bible class teachers to those who stand in the pulpit and preach the message uh, to a local congregation or a local body of believers. But whether we're talking about the first century or the second century, God made room for these kind of people. Now the next question is why? Look at verse 12 for the equipping of the saints for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. You know what I did just this last week? I had a conversation with a lady from the community. It's a conversation with a lady who evidently years ago used to worship right here. but she doesn't anymore. She said when she was here, she found that there was good Bible teaching, good Bible preaching. 
she said, but you know, my kids weren't getting as much out of it. They, they didn't have very many activities. They, they didn't have a lot going on. And I wanted to take them someplace where they would have fun. So she did. Took them to a place where they had fun right here in town. Had a big youth program, but that youth program was more about getting together and eating and watching movies and playing games than it was about learning God's word and God's will for man. You want to know why we were having that conversation? She was downhearted because her children did not know God. They had had fun, but the fun wore off after a while. And where were they left? She said where they went. Yeah, they had fun, but they didn't learn the Bible. They didn't learn God's word. Now, what is that message for us today? Certainly, we want our kids to have fun. Certainly, we want them to enjoy good activities and enjoy good fellowship. The kids had a wonderful time yesterday afternoon at Ed and Sandy Robinson's house. They grilled out and they rode the golf cart and they played uh, soccer and, and they had a lot. Of, but you know what they also did? They spent time in God's Word. They spent time singing and they spent time learning because that's our most important goal. The reason that there are evangelists and pastors and teachers is to equip the saints for the work of service. It is so that we as members of the body of Christ have the tools to live our lives correctly and righteously and faithfully for Jesus and so that we can share with others by our words and by our examples how they can do the same. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17 reads, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable to you. Realize that we have various leaders. We have different people who will stand up and different people who will stand out and lead us. Let's don't envy them. Let's don't resent them. Let's realize that this is part of God's plan for His people to be successful, to be victorious, to be on top. And if we want to stay on top, we can't forget that fact. And we need to help those who would lead us. We need to encourage those who would lead us. We need to make sure that their job is easier as a result of our efforts, not harder. Any one of us who have been in situations of employment over others realize that it is those workers who help us, who assist us, who, who take the, uh, the reins and run and, 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 and make sure that there's nothing that we have to worry for. These are the people that we appreciate. I've got a young lady who runs a business for me up in Missouri, and I don't have to pay much attention to it because of the good shot job she does. I trust her, and she takes care of me as a result. That's the kind of person that we want and in the church, that's the kind of people we need. Elders need that. Bible class teachers need that. Parents need that. All of us need those who would help us to achieve victory as opposed to forgetting God ever so quickly and falling to defeat. What's our conclusion? Real simple. We as members of the body of Christ need to always be diligent to always remember and never forget the Lord our God. If we're going to be any different from the Israelites in the book of Judges, then we cannot, we should not, we must not ever forget who's in charge, who loves us, who wants to be on our side, and who can and will save us in the end if we will be true to Him and vigilant about being His faithful children. Ephesians chapter 6 verses 18 through 20 reads, With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. And pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. 
You know, I think about that verse very personally. I take it very personally. Because it is a prayer that I ask of you all the time. That you will pray for me that the things that I say in this pulpit will be the things that are right, will be the things that are true, that will not be said simply to make people feel at ease, but will be said to make sure that they are equipped with what they need to be true to God. Sometimes the equipment that we need requires in us a change. There may be people here today who are not members of the body of Christ. They have never repented of their sins up with confession in their hearts, uh, confessed with their mouth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They may have never been baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of sins so that those sins can be washed away so that they can be born again, raised to walk in newness of life. That may have never happened. And brethren, I want to be real clear. I want to speak boldly that if you have not been baptized into Christ, if you have not come in contact with the blood of Jesus that cleanses us all, you cannot be saved from your sins. That's the only way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. If you have not come in contact with the blood of Christ this morning, make the decision to do so so that you can be saved as well. And if you are a member of the body of Christ, please learn from history. Learn to not be forgetful, but rather to be one who remembers and in faith one who does. And if we can help you to do that this morning, let us know how we can while together we stand and sing.